What in the name of Claremont is this? Now available on Lulu, John Haynes at Death's Door. The man who rules the world takes on the Greek god of death in this action-packed, all-new John Haynes comic book. Get your copy of the first John Haynes comic at Lulu.com today. Better get the cool slow, y'all, because we're having us a barbecue. <laughs>
what happened was she's gone from becoming the teacher to the student and is now learning about the world of the 21st century as she takes on different jobs going where she's needed to help people. And with the Esteem series, this is a series about a former demon in Lucifer's Legion starting a relationship with God. And as she has given her life to Christ, she is learning more and more about God. And as she's learning more and more about God, she is taking on her former allies in Lucifer's Legion. And that is the mission of the Esteem book. Now, with the John Haynes series, it's about John Haynes, a black man who Lucifer hates. He's made him the CEO of his company, Morris Phillips. And as he's working in that corporate hell, he's as he's working to take care of business as related to his career, he's taking on supernatural threats in Lucifer's Legion. So all three of those books have a mission that is clearly laid out in the first story, and that is presented in each of the stories in each of the books of the series. But my problem with Isom from the first issue of the Ripperverse, as it started in the first issue of Isom, is that we don't have a mission to what Isom is fighting for and what motivates him to go out here and put on that costume. That's something we got with Spider-Man in Amazing Fantasy 15, we know that what motivates Peter Parker to fight the bad guys is the fact that he lost his Uncle Ben. And because he lost his Uncle Ben due to his selfishness, this is why he selflessly continues to want to fight so no one else suffers like he did when he lost his uncle. Same thing for Bruce Wayne when he became Batman. He, when he lost his parents, he wound up wanting to make sure no other eight-year-old boy suffered like he suffered. So this is why he puts on the cape and cowl as Batman. But with Isom, I really don't get a sense of what he's fighting for. And his whole approach to going out here is basically very passive. And because his approach is very passive, we don't really get a sense of who he is, what he wants to fight for, or why should we care, like we do in other genres of comics, like superhero comics, uh, slice of life comics, or even action adventure comics, or fantasy comics. We never get that sense of this isom character going out here and what motivates him to go out here and fight the good fight. And that's a problem for me as a writer with over 25 years experience, I mean, when I look at this book, I really don't see good structure as related to storytelling. I don't see Eric July answering three critical questions that every writer has to answer before we ever put a finger to the keyboard. Who is the main character? What do they want? And why should we care? And the second issue of Isom has a real serious problem in getting me to care because this first issue really starts out very passively with Isom or Avery not even appearing on the first page. And that's a problem when you're doing comics because the first page of everybody's comic may possibly be their first one. This is something I learned reading from Jim Shooter on his blog that the first comic in a person's hands may be the first comic that they have. And that's going to be their entry point. And this book isn't a good, doesn't do a good job of being an entry point to a new reader. No, a good first issue shows you the lead character on the first page in a splash. And again, answers those three questions. Who is the main character? What do they want? And why should we care? But on the first page of Isom, we, instead of us learning why Isom quit, which was presented on the cover, and what motivated him to do this, what we get is Isom's sister, Altona, st standing in an elevator talking to a dude. And that's not how you open a comic, because that's a very passive opening. And it's an opening that takes us away from the hero and doesn't really make the hero the center of the story. Now, this entire book, again, opens up with Isom's sister, Altona, running into Pookie, or as he's called, Darren, in the book. 
and Darren is at her office sitting at her desk, and as he's sitting there, he's confronting her regarding the confrontation that he had with Isom in the previous issue. This is not a way you start a story. No, this you give me a cover showing asking the question, why did Isom quit? But you don't give me the story that you present on the cover. This is really bad writing as I see it at, from my years of reading comics and going out here and, and, you, and studying comics, and this is not how you open up a comic. And as this action is going on, and this action is taking up one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, six, seven pages, we don't get to see Isom in his own book. No, we get an expository sequence about Altona's boss confronting Darren and letting Darren know that he's fired all of his people, showing us that Darren really isn't a threat. And this is a pattern with Eric July. It seems like all the black characters are background characters, and that's not a good look for a comic with a black lead hero, that the black hero is in the background of his book to the point where supporting characters are at the foreground of the book, and the way we see Isom is in a flashback sequence seven pages in, and he only shows up at this Comic-Con where there's been some guy going berserk and wreaking havoc, and as he's wreaking havoc, there's some cosplayer who's hiding in the back, and as she's hiding in the back with her friend, Isom shows up to save the day. And as Isom is saving the day, he's really not again being a showing as a lead character. He's being shown as, again, being very passive in the background. He's talking about how the area is being secured by other people, but he's not leading and showing us how actively he's being a hero. No, he's passively in the background, and as he's passively in the background, helping out this white blonde girl and her friend who's cosplaying, he runs into this Chad Ran character, which looks like some sort of version of Ripclaw meets the Hulk. And as he runs into this Ripclaw meets the Hulk character, we get some really sloppy sequencing on the page where they have a fight. And this sequencing is, again, very sloppy overall. And we get Isom, who hits the Chad Ran, but the Chad Ran isn't really phased. He's talking in another language. And he's chasing after the cosplaying white girl, and Isom tries to fight him, and as he's trying to fight him, sadly, she winds up getting hurt, and as she winds up getting hurt, then Isom just isn't able to take this guy, and, she, and he feels overwhelmed because this guy has so much power. And as a result of this fight, this white girl winds up dying, and this is supposed to be the reason why Isom quit. And the whole sequence just feels really random, and it really doesn't have that emotional impact, and it doesn't have that emotional impact due to the way that Eric July wrote the entire sequence. I mean, had he started out with a splash showing people fleeing from the con and Isom charging, and then showing Isom fighting this Chad Ram, and then this Chad Ram going after a certain individual who it was dressed up in the cosplay outfit, going out here and looking to help him fight this, this Chad Ram, and then this leading to her demise, that would have had more of an emotional impact, similar to the way it had in the opening inciting incident of the first episode of Batman Beyond, because the opening episode of Batman Beyond executed this whole sequence that Eric July is trying to execute far better, where they showed Bruce going out here looking to try to save a family friend from the Vreeland family, and older Bruce is taking on these criminals, and as a result of him becoming overwhelmed, he winds up picking up the gun, and that basically, it, it just basically bookends Bruce's story, because Bruce's story started with a gun, and with it ending with a gun, Basically, this bookend shows that the story of Bruce as Batman is over. But with Isom, we don't get that kind of thought as related to execution due to Eric July's inexperience as a storyteller. And because of his inexperience as a storyteller, we get this sequence, and then we get a sequence which shows us 
uh, Avery sitting up with the guy who is his tailor and him sitting with the tailor just it doesn't really work well overall it just doesn't really flow organically as a story and as the story goes on we get a wasted page as I see it was related to him driving to his ranch and as he drives to his ranch this is where the story is supposed to start and we, here we are about 13 14 pages in and what I see from a from Eric July with his storytelling is that he really doesn't know anything about setting up structure because you're giving me multiple plot threads in the same way that Chris Claremont used to give us multiple plot threads in the late 80s. Now, Chris Claremont was the legendary comic writer who gave us the Phoenix Saga in the X-Men, and he was truly a great writer from the 1970s up until about 1980, towards the end of the Phoenix Saga. And sadly, Chris Claremont's skills over that decade began to decline, and they began to decline because he was been working with these characters for so long that he needed a break from them and sadly Chris didn't get that break and as a result instead of us getting full stories in the X-Men we got a lot of plot threads where everything would start out for a minute but then really wouldn't go anywhere and towards the late 80s towards Inferno and the Reavers we really got some really terrible execution of storylines from Chris Claremont and that's what we get in this overall issue of Isom, it just does not really come together to form a complete story. So when Avery comes into his ranch, this is where he runs into these kind of alien demon creatures. And this really doesn't really work. I, I mean, yeah, they look sort of like Bigfoot, but it just doesn't work because they just show up out of nowhere without any sort of organic progression. I mean, if you want to introduce new characters you need to go out here and wrap up the old plot threads not just tack new ones on because this becomes confusing for the reader and this book was just started to become confusing because we start out with Avery's sister then we go to the Isom flashback then we go to him coming to his ranch none of these story points come together to form a plot point I mean, you give me Why Did Isom Quit on the cover, and I would have liked to have seen a flashback sequence where Isom confronts this Chadram, and this is the reason for the story. That would have made me care, but this, it just turns into a jumbled mess of plot threads and no real structure for a story. That is the big problem with Isom number two, is that there is no real cohesive story we just get a bunch of mismatched plot threads, and these mismatched plot threads are supposed to come together and be the overall story. Now, I look at this whole system, and they're saying, oh, we know who you are, but what are you? That's what Avery is asking, and as he's having a fight with them, this is where they will go out here, and then after sending their message saying, he will be seeing you soon, then they wind up being ignited on fire and this sets fire to Avery's uh, branch uh, barn and this leads to the barn winding up winding up on fire and as it winds up on fire and Avery's dealing with an injury this is where they, they decide to instead just introduce a new character called Gooding who's going to put out the fire in Avery's barn and this character is supposed to be some sort of superhero or some sort of guy who comes in and does things similar to damage control and we instead of us getting some the story moving we just get another introduction of a character in the ripaverse and that really again impedes an already weak story and already impedes it by adding more plot threads and this is further added but the alpha core coming we're looking at the alpha core headquarters because as gooding is putting out the fire the alpha core are talking about their confrontation with Yaira, and this further pushes Avery and Isom further to the background of his own story, and instead of Avery being the center of his story, we get focuses on all of these other characters, and no real focus that really shows us what the mission of Isom is supposed to be. Again, 
I, in, in a comic, you have to have a mission for your characters, and that sets the direction. And this book, again, doesn't know whether it wants to be a superhero comic, a detective comic, or it wants to be a supernatural comic. We really don't get a sense of what this whole book is supposed to be about. And this book, again, as, as Gooding puts out the fire, he goes out and talks about um, some things as related to his business, and we get a picture of Gooding and his services with his robot dog, and then we move into well, Avery going back home, where he gets a cell phone call from his sister telling him about what happened with this situation from her boss, and the boss talking about the confrontation that Darren had with his sister, and Avery becoming emotional and saying he's going to kill Darren. Again, not really good writing. And then we go to Club Mero where Darren, or Pookie as I call him, is, and him dealing with the aftermath of Avery's sister's boss firing all of his people, and the except winding up losing his job after winding up drawing with Isom. All plot threads that basically go nowhere and basically just are just there for the sake of being there. Then we go to Obertonic Arena, where there's a wrestling show going on, and as the wrestling show is going on, we've got Larry Suge Knight, and I'm wondering, what does this have to do with the story? Because whenever you're writing a story, everything needs to be focused on what is core to the book, as related to the first three to five pages, but this basically comes out of nowhere, just like a classic Chris Claremont um, plot thread, and it just is it just just makes the book that much harder to read. I mean, when I go out here and I'm writing stories, I want readers to know within the first three to five pages who the main character is, what they want, why should we care, and get you into the story. But we're almost 30, 40 pages into the second issue of Isom, and everybody's at an, in, getting parts in his book, but er, but Avery himself. I mean, we get this Larry Suge Knight, who's a wrestler, and he's going into business for himself. And what I mean by going into business is that this wrestler is going out here and telling his own story, and instead of following the script, and this is here for two or three pages, and I'm wondering why it's here. I mean... Yeah, you want to build up for future stories, but this is not how you do it. No, you want to make sure that your plot is centered to your story, and you want to make sure that your plot is centered to your story so that the reader can focus on that story. That's what you want to do in your issue. You want the lead character driving the story, but with this book, everybody's got points in the story, but but Avery and Isom himself. And we don't see anything as related to this story. I mean, just we get all these different sequences as related to things, and we got this whole sequence with this white feet with another white female, and they're talking about something going on, and then we get another sequence of a guy talking about from the from uh, from this whole company, and there's a, a attempt to kill a guy, and he's in a bulletproof car, but the henchman he's driving who's driving the car is set up to be killed, and again, then we get back to Avery, who decides to go out here and go get his piece, and go get his piece to go meet Mrs. Wallace, who is, I believe, Sam's wife. And as they go there, then they go back to Gooding's residence, and they go to meet Gooding at his residence, and he talks about some things as related to Sam's abduction, and as he goes to talk about Sam's abduction, he then talks about these creatures once more that were featured previously in the story. And as this is going on, after this goes on, Avery goes to sleep, does some boxing, then goes out here and find, gets his new costume from his tailor and puts on his book costume right after everything and starts to go out on a mission. Again, just not good writing overall. I mean, you're just putting together plot threads with no real story. And these plot threads lead to this confrontation of Avery at this castle in Texas, which makes no logical sense. 
and at this castle as he's looking to go find Sam, this is when he meets Sidney Bloodruth. Now he meets Sidney Bloodruth, who has these wolves and a dragon that work for her, and they're going to go to find out what's going on with these demon or alien creatures or whatever they are, or skinwalkers, I don't know what they are, and they're supposed to go there and go to confront these creatures in order to find Sam, and I'm still trying to figure out what, how these creatures know Avery and how they know about his power. We get no real revelation of this in the whole cor course of this book. They're just there, and they just show up, and Sidney just shows up to use some mystic power, and we really don't get a sense of why they targeted Avery. None of this really builds into any sort of payoff, and he sets up plot threads, but they don't really pay off into anything, and everything sets up for a climax as related to Sydney, Bloodruth, and Avery confronting these creatures, and as they're confronting these creatures, we get Bloodruth letting, finding Sam and getting him out, and Sam having some sort of thing on his back, and then Sam winding up escaping with Sydney, and as they escape, we got we get Isom going out here and powering up in some sort of way, creating some sort of explosion that winds up killing all of these uh, demon or whatever creatures they are. And the last page is Isom running away. And at the end of the book, I'm still trying to figure out what this book is about. I'm still trying to figure out, does this book want to be a superhero book? Does it want to be a mystery book? Does it want to be a supernatural book? And I can't figure out what it wants to be, but according to people on the far right and members of Comicsgate, this is going to be the book that's supposed to save the comic book industry. And I have to say, no, this book is not going to be the one that saves the comic book industry. Yes, Eric D. July got a lot of success in the short term as related to raising over three million dollars as related to the first Isom book and he also got even more money with Isom too but I don't really see the story there that's going to make this book into the kind of phenomenon that Harry Potter or Power Rangers became. No, I don't really see the storytelling being presented here that's going to get anybody outside of the groups of Comicsgate and the far right to go out here and buy this book. No, the quality isn't on the page of Isom. And while I hear many people in Comicsgate love to talk about, oh, we're only buying comics based on the merits, on the merits of what was presented here, I didn't see anything as related to quality storytelling, and I know that I could go out here and tell a far better story than what Eric July has presented in the pages of Isom. What I presented in my 2022 comic, John Haynes at Death's Door, blows the doors of everything presented in the over 100 or so pages of Isom, and everything that I present it in John Haynes at Death's Door would blow the doors off everything that Eric July tried to do in a hundred pages I can go out here and do in 32. And if I had the support that Eric July had, I would be going out here producing quality comics every year and going out here and adapting much of the work that I've produced on the SJS Direct imprint, like the books that I currently have scripts for, like Isis All That Glitters and Isis The Beauty Myth, and I would also love to do books like John Haynes' The Man With Nothing To Lose, and I know that I could go out here and produce something of higher quality than what Eric July has presented in the pages of this dreadful second issue of Isom, because what was presented here in the second issue of Isom is of the same poor quality that I saw from writers like Chris Claremont when he was when his career skills were on the decline. I mean, Chris Claremont back in the days 
of those later issues of X-Men really gave us some really meandering plot threads and meandering stories that basically went nowhere. And this book basically feels like one of those old issues of X-Men where the quality really wasn't there because Chris's head wasn't in the game. And I'd also go on to say that it also reminds me of the poor quality of the Titans after the Titans hunt when Marv Wolfman was burnt out on Titans but still needed to make a paycheck. And I remember those books that Marv was producing in the New Titans era where he was basically burnt out on Titans but was still trying to keep the book going. But the quality of the stories really started to fall off and that's when we got things like the stoic cyborg we got the speedy as arsenal i mean we got some and we got all of those new titans and characters and those team titans characters really really terrible stories that when you look at them right now they were not of quality compared to classics like built up to the judas contract but happened because the the writer was burnt out and tired but still needed to keep money to keep getting food on the table so that's what I look at when I'm looking at Isom um, number two. I don't really see a book that is of high quality. I really don't see a book that is really what's supposed to be the savior of the comic book industry. No, what I see are a lot of people in far-right groups getting behind Eric July because of his politics and because he was out here supporting the far-right by standing in pictures with guys like Kyle Rottenhouse, what they what they do is create a covert contract with him where they'll support his comic based on his political beliefs, which is quite ironic because Eric July says that comics aren't supposed to be about politics. They're supposed to be about merit, but on the merits, he hasn't really produced a quality comic with this whole issue of ISOM. And the reason why most of the people are supporting him is because of his politics and him supporting the far right and he creates a covert contract where he can be the black guy who can go out here and send the message about them not being so-called woke and them promoting diversity because he's the black guy who they can go out here and try out and present as their representation of a black person who supports their political beliefs and because he presents himself as the shield that shows that these individuals aren't racist, they reward him with purchases of this comic into the millions of dollars. Now, if these individuals, again, are so caught up in quality comics, then I offer them an opportunity to head over to Lulu.com and pick up John Haynes at Death Store. Because if you're on the merits and say you want to be about supporting quality comics, you can pick up a copy of John Haynes at Death Store. Now, this book has been praised by many in the comic industry. Many comic pros who have looked at this book say that it is very well done. And I have to wonder where I have to wonder what happened to those people in Comicscape. Again, they say that they're all about good comics, and I'm all about producing good comics at SJS Direct. But I never saw any of these people going out here looking to pick up or talk about John Haynes at Death's Door the way they do about Isom. And I have to wonder if, if this is all about politics or is it all really about storytelling? Critical question I got to ask most of the people who are out here saying that, you know, this Isom book is the next big thing. But when I read this Isom book, I don't see the next big thing. No, I see a book that is just poorly crafted with no real structure, no real mission, no real direction. And I see a character that really is, again, a background character in his own book. And this background character never really stands out. And he never really stands out in a way that really allows us to connect with him and relate to him the way people have said that they relate to the John Haynes character in my John Haynes series on the SJS Direct imprint. Because I remember when I put pages of John Haynes at Death Store up, I had people say, hey, that really reminds me of my life and reminds me of the people in my life. That's not something we see presented in the pages of most comics. I mean, we don't see this presented regularly. 
And we don't see it because everybody's talking about woke and identity politics, but nobody's really talking about, about developing good stories. That is the problem that I see with this Isom book. Again, after you get out of your feelings about the politics and the flash, and you start focusing on the substance, you start to see that this book really isn't about anything, and the, the writing here really isn't very good at all. I mean, when I look at Isom, the writing is just all over the place, because any good book, again, is going to let you know what it's about on the first three to five pages, but almost seven, ten, fifteen pages in, I still didn't know what Isom 2 was all about. I mean, again, it's a mismatch of plot threads, it's a mismatch of all sorts of ideas, but nothing really comes together to form a cohesive story. And because nothing comes together to form a cohesive story, this book is a complete mess. But you'll have people in groups like Comicsgate think, say that this is the book that's going to save the comic book industry, and that this is the book that shows us that you cannot go out here and support these woke books. But I have to propose, you know, John Haynes at Death's Door isn't woke. It has nothing as related to the far left. It follows all of the models of good three-act storytelling. So why aren't all of those Comicsgate guys running over to pick up a copy of John Haynes at Death's Door? Critical question I'm asking because it seems like the only reason why they pick up the ISOM is because of the politics and that, that Eric July pushes. And because he's a safe black person, this that doesn't threaten their politics, they will go out here and support a book where the black character basically is passive in the background, whereas the white characters become up at the foreground. And that's not the good storytelling as I see it, because a good storyteller wants the lead character to be at the front, regardless of race, and a good storyteller wants their story to be where the lead character is in the lead and not in the background of their own story. Because passive storytelling doesn't allow us to get to know a character, doesn't allow a character to connect with us, doesn't allow us to really get to know this character and care about them, and doesn't really allow us to see what the mission of that character is or see what the purpose of that character is. And what it looks like to me when it comes to Avery or Isom, he's just a background player in his own book. And if you're the background player in your own book, you're coming from a position of weakness as a hero. And if you're coming from a position of weakness as a hero, then readers are not going to care because your character isn't very strong. And if your character isn't active in their own book, then people are not going to see that character as a hero they care about or respect. No, with Isom number two, I don't see a reason to keep reading Isom. I mean, this book is called Why Did Isom Quip? But the irony I have to say about this book is this book looks like the one that would make me want to quit Isom due to the incredibly bad writing. And the incredibly bad writing from Eric July isn't anything revolutionary as related to his claims that, oh, the comic book industry is full of leftists. Well, yeah, maybe it's full of leftists, but one of the problems I have with this industry is it's filled with inexperienced people, and these inexperienced people don't know much about the craft of writing, and because they don't know much about the craft of writing, what they do is go out here and write based on feelings, not understanding that you need to have a structure for your stories, you need to have reasons why characters participate in actions, and you need to have psychological motivations that drive those, motive, those actions, and in a story that's character-driven, we need to get to know characters, we need to get to know people. That is all part of good comic book storytelling, and that's not what we get in this second issue of Isom, which basically feels, again, as I'll keep saying it, a jumbled mess of plot threads that basically are worse than anything Chris Claremont did in his last days on the X-Men, or Marv Wolfman did on his last days on Teen Titans, 
And this book basically shows me that Eric July is burning out as a writer, and he's burning out because he's running on feelings and not really laying out ideas as related to developing a plot or a theme because he has no mission for his characters. And because he has no mission for his characters outside of not being woke, that's the only flash he has to get your attention, but there's no substance to his storytelling. And since there's no substance to his storytelling, this is why I look at this second issue of Isom as one of the worst comics I've ever read, and many of Eric July's followers don't want to hear the truth as related to constructive criticism, so they go out here and look to attack anybody who criticizes him, and that's not really going to help him as a writer. No, as a writer, he really needs to hear that his books are of poor quality, he really doesn't know much about storytelling, and you have to have more in your books than telling people, oh, this book isn't woke, because John Haynes at Death's Door isn't woke. Many of the scripts I've written for books that I cannot afford to produce because I don't have the money to do them, like Isis the Beauty Myth and all that glitters, they aren't woke. And I can go out here and put together stories that aren't so-called woke, but the, yeah, I, when I go out here, I put together a story that has a plot, has multi-dimensional characters, and can answer those three critical questions. Who was the main character? What do they want? Why should we care? And in three to five pages, you know what the book is going to be about. That is what I bring to people when I go out here and present SJS Direct books or SJS Direct comics. Whenever I go out here and I put together books, I try to put together quality and as related to story. So when I listen to Eric July talking about, oh, Isom isn't woke, well, this comic isn't very good either, and you're going to need more than telling me this book isn't woke in order to sell more books, because this book that told me why I some quit is the book where I would quit as related to this entire series due to the absolutely terrible writing and the absolute complete lack of character development, and I would wind up leaving this book because this book isn't about anything but feelings about those on the left, and you need more than focusing on politics if you want to go out here and tell stories in the comic book medium. Now, if you want to check out my first full comic featuring John Haynes, John Haynes at Death's Door, you can pick up your own paper copy of this book that was part of a successful 2022 Kickstarter on lulu.com right now by clicking the links in the description box. And if you want to check out my first full digital comic, Esteem No Good Deed, you can find that comic on Kindle for 99 cents and check out the first full um, East Esteem story on the, in the SJS Direct comic. And if you want to help me be able to get my second comic out there, you guys can send a donation to the Patreon, the PayPal, or the Cash App and help me get the funds to get the first full comic featuring the goddess next door to join the John Haynes and Esteem comic that I did. And if you want to check out many of the stories in the SJS Direct Universe, you can pick up the books of the Isis series, the Esteem series, the John Haynes series, and books like those in the Spinsterella trilogy, and my vampire novel, Eternal Night, or my black sorority novel, The Thetas, you can find all of those books in the SJS Direct Universe in paperback and Kindle format on Amazon.com and other online booksellers like Barnes & Noble, Walmart, the iBookstore, Google Play, and Target. And that's all I have to say for this video. You can comment, rate, and subscribe. Now available in paperback and e-readers, Isis, Revenge of the Cyber Goddess. The Goddess Next Door takes on the threat of a deadly digital diva driven to destroy the world in this action-packed all-new Isis series adventure. Get Isis Revenge of the Cyber Goddess featuring a bonus pin-up and the other two books in the Cyber Goddess saga at online bookstores everywhere today. No! Support Black-owned and Black-operated digital broadcast media. www.niceradionetwork.com Nice Radio Network, broadcasting 24 hours a day, 7 days a week.